Hello everybody. In this video, we're going to look at velocity, speed, and acceleration. So imagine that you're traveling down a long, straight road. And on this road, you have position marked off along the way. So you might have, say, mile markers on a country road. And we could let x denote your position along the road, and we'll start at marker zero for the origin. As we move to the right, we'll increase the value of x. So this is, how, this is the direction in which x gets larger. And you can imagine moving along the road, either to the right or the left. And this is an example of what we'll call rectilinear motion. Now you could plot the position as a function of time. In this case, we'll use the units miles and hours. And if you look at the total collection of points, representing position versus time, you get something that we would like to call a position graph. So the derivative of x with respect to t is the instantaneous rate of change of position with respect to time. Graphically, it is the tangent slope of the position graph, and it's what we call the instantaneous velocity. If the slope's positive, we have a positive velocity. In terms of our motion, we are traveling to the right in this picture. For negative slopes, our velocity is negative, in which case we should imagine motion to the left. Now, we shouldn't really care whether the car is actually backing up or moving forward. In fact, we should rather imagine an idealized point particle car that has no front or back. When we talk about positive velocity, we mean motion towards the right. And when we talk about negative velocity, we mean motion towards the left. Now we could ask a couple of questions. What is the velocity of an object? And how fast is an object moving? Another way to ask this second question is, what is the speed of an object? What is the velocity of an object? What is the speed of an object? These turn out not to be the same question. To give you an idea of why, let's imagine that we have rectilinear motion along a path moving from west to east, or east to west, depending on which direction you're heading, and that path goes through a town where the speed limit is 35 miles per hour. And you're traveling along to the west, and your rate of change in that direction is 50 miles per hour. And the local town officer informs you that you are exceeding the speed limit. To which you reply, well, actually, officer, I'm imagining the positive direction is to the east. And since I'm traveling to the west, my velocity is actually negative 50 miles per hour. And since negative 50 is less than 35, actually, I haven't exceeded the speed limit. Most likely, the officer will not be impressed by this argument. And the reason the officer will not be impressed by this argument is because it is a speed limit, not a velocity limit. What do we mean by speed? If we take the rate of change of position with respect to time, we get the velocity. Speed is the absolute value of that quantity. One way to think of velocity is as an arrow. So the arrow points in the direction of motion, and you can have longer arrows when your rate of change is greater in that direction. So in this case, we can distinguish between negative velocity and positive velocity by the direction which the arrow points. Speed is a velocity length. So whether you travel 30 centimeters per second to the right or 30 centimeters to the second to the left, you'll have different velocities. They differ by a sign. But we want to say that the speed is the same. Speed is simply the length of these arrows. And lengths are always non-negative. So a velocity graph can dip above or below the horizontal axis. But if you want to look at the associated speed graph, whatever parts of the velocity graph lie below should simply be flipped above, because we're taking the absolute value. So you can see that the values of a speed function always are greater than or equal to zero. In other words, speed is always non-negative. Let's take a look at a specific example. Suppose we have a particle that's moving to the right here, and it seems to be speeding up. And say our position function looked like this. The velocity being the rate of change of the position function, we could look at some tangent slopes and plot those values of the tangent slope. And in this case, we see that the velocity is changing as well. 
So the velocity itself could possibly change as a function of time. We might be interested in the rate of change of velocity. And that brings us to the definition of acceleration. So the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. And this would be the second derivative of position with respect to time. Now in our example, it so happens that the slope of the velocity function is constant and equal to one. So in this case, our acceleration is constant and that's always equal to one. In this case, the units would be centimeters per second per second or centimeters per second squared. Now there are many options for notation for these ideas. So we have position, velocity, and acceleration. So let's just pick some names for these, x, v, and a. And we can emphasize that they're functions of time. Using Leibniz notation, the velocity is dx dt. Lagrange notation would have us write x prime of t. The acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, but it's also then the second derivative of position with respect to time. And in Lagrange notation, we could write v prime for the acceleration or x double prime of t. Let's pause for a second to get our hands on an explicit example. This is an example that is all around us. So it's a fact that near the surface of the Earth, an object in free fall that is under the influence of the force of gravity only has a constant acceleration towards the Earth. So let's imagine that we have rectilinear motion in the vertical direction, and this object is in free fall, which is to say there's no force on it other than gravity. Now the constant acceleration is usually denoted g for the gravitational constant. So in metric units, g is approximately 9.78 meters per second squared. Also using old imperial units, uh, g is approximately 32.2 feet per second squared. We will use the metric system for this problem, meters for position, seconds for time, in which case our constant acceleration for free fall motion is pointing down towards the earth, so it'll be a negative quantity. So our acceleration of an object in free fall will simply be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if we know that's the acceleration, what could the velocity possibly be? So all we need to do is figure out a function whose derivative would be the constant negative 9.8. Well, that's going to be negative 9.8t. But we could also add a constant because the derivative of a constant is zero, so that won't contribute to the derivative. So we, we should add a constant and we'll call it v sub zero or v naught. Why would we give this constant this name? Well, here's why. Because if you plug zero into this formula for t, the only thing that survives is the constant v naught. The constant v naught then is precisely the velocity at time t equals zero. So we give this suggestive name v sub zero to indicate that it's velocity at time zero. Now we don't need to know that constant to ask the question, what would the position function be? So once again, we're gonna play this game where we have to imagine what function would have derivative equal to negative 9.8t plus v naught. Well, the power rule in reverse, we know if we cut that coefficient in half, negative 4.9t squared is going to be a function whose derivative with respect to t is negative 9.8t. Similarly, v naught times t, whatever constant we have there, v naught, v naught times t is going to be a function whose derivative is just the constant v naught. And once again, we get to add a constant. And in the same spirit as the previous calculation, we'll call that constant y naught because when we plug in zero into this position function, we get y at zero. So the constant y naught is precisely the position at time t equals zero. So here we are, the acceleration, the velocity, and the position. And these are the so-called kinematic equations for free fall motion. Let's take a look at a velocity graph. We're plotting velocity now. And we can see that the rate of change of velocity, i.e. the acceleration, might be positive, might be negative. So acceleration can be negative. What might that mean? So imagine we have rectilinear motion here in a vertical axis. 
And we'll imagine that our units have been chosen so that as we move up, we're increasing the position. In this case then, positive velocities you can think of as arrows pointing upward and negative velocities you can think of arrows pointing downward. And we want to explore the question, what does it mean for acceleration to be positive or negative? So first let's think about positive acceleration. If the rate of change of velocity is greater than zero, then the velocity is, so to speak, wanting to become larger. As we watch the velocity evolve in time, if the acceleration is positive, then positive velocities should grow because these velocities want to increase. The velocity wants to get larger, so to speak. Now, a little more subtle, if the velocity were negative, what does it mean to get larger? So you need to become less negative. So your arrows would still be pointing in the negative direction for negative velocity, but they'd be getting shorter. As you move your way across from left to right here, you can see how velocities are changing when the acceleration is positive. Now let's think about negative acceleration. The rate of change of velocity with respect to time is negative. So in this case, the velocity wants, so to speak, to become smaller. So what would that look like? Well, as time evolves, if you had a positive velocity, if you want it to become smaller, then the velocity had better become less positive. The length of the arrow should shrink. And of course, if you have negative velocities and you have negative acceleration, those negative velocity vectors want to get larger because you want to get more negative. You want the velocity to become even smaller. So positive acceleration means velocity arrows change to point more in the positive direction. And similarly, negative acceleration means velocity arrows change to point more in the negative direction. One more topic, speeding up and slowing down. So in the case of negative acceleration, we have this idea that velocity arrows are wanting to point less and less in the positive direction, or if you like, more and more in the negative direction. Similarly, with positive acceleration, our velocity vectors, as we watch the clock run, are going to become more and more positive. Now, if you look at these two cases, you can see that the lengths are decreasing i.e. the speed is decreasing. So when is this happening? When the acceleration is negative and the velocity is positive. Or another possibility is that the acceleration is positive and the velocity is negative. Now take a look at these two cases. Notice as time evolves how the lengths are increasing. So in these two cases, speed is increasing. And what's going on during these moments? Well, one possibility is the acceleration is negative and the velocity is negative. And in the other instance, the acceleration is positive and the velocity is positive. So let's summarize these in one table. The speed is increasing, which is to say the object is speeding up when either the acceleration and the velocity are both negative or the acceleration and the velocity are both positive. The speed is decreasing, or in other words, the object is slowing down when either the acceleration is negative and the velocity is positive, or the acceleration is positive and the velocity is negative. Here's another way to look at it. This means the speed is increasing when the acceleration and the velocity have the same sign which is to say the product of the acceleration and the velocity is greater than zero. The object is slowing down when the acceleration and the velocity have opposite signs, which is to say the product of the acceleration and the velocity is negative. Here's yet another way to look at it. When the velocity and acceleration work together, so to speak, then the object speeds up. When the velocity and acceleration work against each other, then the object slows down. Let's look at a really quick calculus proof. So we'll let S 
denote the speed function, which is to say the absolute value of the velocity. We wish to know if s prime of t is greater than zero or s prime of t is less than zero. Notice if s prime of t is greater than zero, i.e. the rate of change of s is increasing, that means we're speeding up. And if s prime of t is less than zero, means the rate of change of speed is negative, it means the object is slowing down. Now, if we square the speed function, we're gonna get the same thing as if we squared the velocity function. So let's take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. We're gonna use the power rule and the chain rule, and we can cancel the twos. Now, the speed is the absolute value of velocity, and the derivative of velocity is the acceleration. And we can substitute in the other pieces so here we have an equation, and this is going to be the key to everything, because the absolute value of the velocity, this quantity, can never be negative. And that means we can isolate this part of the equation. S prime of t is greater than zero, if and only if the product of the two factors on the right side are positive. Similarly, the only way S prime of t can be negative is if the product of the factors on the right are negative as well. And as a bonus, we also notice that the rate of change of speed is zero precisely when either the velocity is zero or the acceleration is zero. In either of those instances, we know that the instantaneous rate of change of speed is zero at that moment. In other words, the particle is neither speeding up nor slowing down.